So let me read you this thing before you record because you might not want to, you might not want to rec record it. These are two, I've been writing letters to the editor to my local paper, which is Sonoma County Press Democrat, Santa Rosa Press Democrat, and they've been doing that. Now they've upped me to opinion pieces. So they've, they've published the first one about money in the political system. And the second one is about, is about voting mandate, is about vaccine mandates. And I just wanted to share it with you. You can decide if you want to send it out to your audience or not. Go ahead. Uh, it's called, it, it starts with a quote, if you don't wear pink on Wednesdays, you can't sit with us. Karen Smith to Katie Heron, Mean Girls. This seems to be the way that many people respond to mandates, as if they're being unfairly judged and excluded. Mm -hmm. Not surprisingly, their response is usually shame, aggression, or defensiveness. For a trivial issue like personal style, it's an understandable response. But let's change the context a moment. Unvaccinated people are becoming seriously ill and dying in extraordinary numbers, hosting new cases of the COVID virus. They threaten public health by becoming petri dishes, nurturing vaccine-eluding variants like Omicron. When they sicken, they arrive at the hospital and receive state-of-the-art care like everyone else. As a consequence, hospitals are bursting at the seams. Doctors are taking out ads, begging people to become vaccinated. Nurses are sick, exhausted, and even quitting the business. Beds are not available for patients requiring operations, cancer treatments, or emergency room aftercare. From, the point of view, from this point of view, the 55% of citizens who've been meticulous about caring for themselves, relatives, and neighbors by becoming vaccinated, boosted, and vigorous about masking are penalized by the careless behavior of the 45% cloaking their refusals in whack-a-mole conspiracy theories. Mm. Irritated as one might be about plaints concerning personal liberty, simple decency and the Hippocratic Oath will demand that anyone who arrives ill at a hospital will be treated. Consequently, that reduces our options to three mandating vaccines, triaging patients, and or refusing to pay medical costs of the unvaccinated. Mandates are not a sinister new example of government overreach. Vaccinations for mumps, chickenpox, measles, diphtheria, tuberculosis are mandatory in most school districts. Seat belts are a mandate. Motorcycle helmets are mandated in many states, as are bicycle helmets. A stop sign is a mandate. To overcome resistance to vaccinations, it will require unyielding pressure, perhaps denying income tax rebates, unemployment benefits, car registrations, or driver's license renewal, at the least refusing access to any public venues, the mean girls option. This will also require uncounterfeitable vaccination cards. Triage, from the French word to select, is already common medical practice. If you show up for a liver transplant with a history of alcohol use, you move to the back of the line. Ditto for a lung transplant if you're a smoker. There are other criteria for heart transplants. Faced with overwhelming patients, perhaps hospitals will have to move the unvaccinated to the back of the line for available beds. The no pay option. The final option might be that insurance companies, public and private, begin to reconsider whether or not they'll continue to bear the costs of people who've taken so few precautions to protect themselves and their community. Tough steps for tough times. That's what I do with my time. That's, that's my, my practice of engaged Buddhism. Well, I think that is great. I'm so glad, so glad that you are combining all of your wisdom and your philosophy and writing it and sending it and putting it out in a public space. And I just recorded that and I'm going to share the whole thing and I'm going to share it on social media as well. Like I, I feel at this point you write, that's an op-ed for the nation, for the world. When you, you things live in only one place that, that should be heard and seen in many places. And there's so many places you need a TikTok account. We all do. 
Um, that's great. So I, can I, I re can I read you one more that was published last Sunday? Absolutely, please. Yes. Okay. We hear it every day. 70% of Americans favor stricter gun laws. 70% want to outlaw assault weapons. 70% favor maintaining a woman's right to choose. David Hogg, the brilliant young survivor of the 2018 high school shooting in Parkland, Florida, appeared on the morning news recently describing rallies to secure background checks and reasonable gun regulations as the largest in history. Andrea Mitchell, the news anchor, pointed out that in spite of such numbers, there's no federal legislation on the issue, and asked him how he felt about, quote, the political stalemate in this country, close quote. In such a context, any query that includes the word politics is a fig leaf lofting the comforting image of principled men and women debating policies and nuances of the law, struggling together to create a more perfect union. Hmm. That is a mental pet that Newt Gingrich dragged out into a field and shot 25 years ago, <laughs> creating diversions to disguise the hidden cancer metastasizing in our political system money, the Gordian knot binding together most of our political dysfunctions. Apparently, it's taboo to mention publicly that our entire political system is organized around raising, hoarding, and spending it. When the Supreme Court declared political contributions to be free speech, capital was afforded ownership of the soapbox and the megaphone. Its desires now trump human needs. As a consequence, our political system forces the most principled public servants into draconian choices to remain in office. The least principled simply open their suitcases to receive the bundled money. Donations are repaid with legislative favors and tax fiddles invisible to the average citizen. Over the past 50 years, these creative fiddles have resulted in the middle 60% of American earners what economists call the middle class, owning only 26.6% of the national wealth, according to Bloomberg News. The top 1% controls 27%, which is to say more than the entire middle class. A three-step solution could transform our government from a wholly owned subsidiary of Wall Street into an agency operating for the public benefit. One, full federal funding of elections. Taxpayers hire the legislators, give each the same amount of money, and study their creativity in spending it. Two, prohibit all corporate donations. They are donating to alter public policy to benefit their shareholders. Their employees are free to vote. Three, prohibit all gifts and emoluments from lobbyists. According to Reuters, 12,553 federal lobbyists in Washington spend more than $3.5 billion annually on our Congress. Recent decisions facilitating unlimited anonymous political contributions have enfeebled the power of voters, transforming our founder's system into a corporatocracy. Anxious to deliver a death blow to voter resistance, Republicans now seek to guarantee permanent victory in future elections by making it legal for their secretaries of states and legislators to overturn the people's electors. In the face of this death sentence to democracy, Democrats lull themselves to sleep, maintaining the charade that we still live in the imagined nation, founded and forged by George Washington, Ben Franklin, James Madison, et al., what a sorry, indulgent, spoiled pack of children we've become. Parkland survivor David Hogg, half the age of my own children, said it best. If the system fails to protect young people, it endangers the future of our republic. A child can see that. But the Supreme Court and legislators dependent on donations to survive cannot. I took a lot of notes on that one. So says Big Mouth. Anyway. Uh, I, I like it a lot. And if I can just jump into a question that ties maybe both of those op-eds together that I think that you can speak to. 
you you had this line in that one that says uh capital desires trump human needs and i think that is true of the the other op-ed and covid related issues and the question to you is we have we need to have a different conversation or or define certain words and ideas differently than we maybe that we do freedom wealth liberty national security spending a trillion dollars on defense when the enemy is a domestic terrorists and b racism health, well health Econo- issues not economic diversity and the pandemic andrew basevich very brilliant you he know is, who he is yeah he's a friend i've had dinner with him he's joined me on the show many times okay so me too so his last book was about exactly this yes Exactly this. The military, like the French just before World War II, completely missing the boat, building battleships, sophisticated submarines, nuclear weapons, which have done zip shit about protecting us against COVID, racism, uh, white supremacy, the economic divide. So, yeah, it's the same issue. Well, and if you go back to if go ahead. I was just going to say the when you say racism, I think most people would say, how is that an issue? And that's because it's not an issue for most people. But if you're a person of color or a person who's marginalized, discriminated against regularly, that is your national security issue on a regular basis. It's, it's, it's our fault for not talking to them to see them. But after 9-11, uh, I've, I've said this many times on the show, but after 9-11, I was interviewing a black comedian and he just started making fun of me and other white people for being afraid of terrorism for the first time in our lives. Yes, exactly right. And so the other, the, the flip side of that is that the invisible, the, the privileges that white people get that are invisible to them. White people never worry if they're in the wrong place. They never worry about keeping their hands in a, uh, outside their pockets in a store so they won't be accused of pickpocketing. They never accuse of having to relax white people by laughing all the time. <laughs> and the problem is not, as most white, white people define it, being rude to a black person. The problem is systemic racism, which makes it impossible for black people to get equal education, business loans, you know, feel safe for their life in the hands of the police. So it's it's a problem because we can't come together as one people. And I don't know what we're spending in cities like Chicago and the killing zones in black neighborhoods we allow to exist, but it's a lot of money. I, and it's certainly destroying our unity as a nation. Yeah, I mean, but more even more specifically, if the threat is terrorist, who should Americans generally be more afraid of? Al Qaeda, jihadist, Muslim militant terrorists from foreign countries or even maybe homegrown radicalists here in America or white supremacists, extremist militias, which are clearly almost every day if the newspaper they are either getting caught uh, attempting or plotting some crime and again going back to who are they committing the crime to minil- minimize and marginalize and what are they doing to what are they trying to uphold back to your point uh, just about the national security issue for you know black and brown folks in this country is completely different well, and and for white people there was a decision made during the bush administration to basically put white uh white separatists and white terrorists off the chart. So we were bombing, strafing, doing uh, targeted killings of brown people and Muslims all over the globe. And while we were doing that, the white malefactors in our own country were completely ignored by law enforcement. Yep. They were just off the chart. So this is a this is another way in which racism enters the picture. Well, those guys are not going to bother me. Well, that's what you think until they take over the reins of government, you know, and you say something they don't agree with. So I'm a big fan of Andrew Bacevich. Uh, I consider him a friend too. He's given me a blurb for one of my books and I've helped him with with the Quincy Institute. But he's the only guy talking about military policy and social policy in a way that makes sense to me. Have you uh, are you familiar with Spencer Ackerman and his new book, Reign of Terror? Yes, I'm reading it. Oh, good. I'm reading it right now. Yep. It's good. really good. 
And yep. that's where I got that. That's where I, I learned more fully about the way in which uh, white terrorists were put off the charts after right. 9-11. Yes. Yeah, it's a very good book. Either you were when you moved close to that mic, by the way, it sounded better when you were a little closer. Oh, OK. I'll sit yeah, over I, it. Thanks. That's fine. Uh, we all want the the coyote, all of it. So what have you been up to? Uh, you know, let's talk about the pandemic and how it's affected our lives in so many different ways. I'm super interested to hear how you think the pandemic has affected America, American culture or, you know, humanity, because it's. If it wasn't so horrific in terms of how many lives it's taken and destroyed, it would be interesting to kind of examine what it has done to change the way that we live, talk, treat each other. Do you have, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I think about it all the time. Um, first of all, I think about the fact that most of the people I know who are middle class people, white people by and large, but more even middle class is more apt, are afforded the privilege of sequestering. So we work from home, you know, and by by a trick of definition, we've uh, nominated our entire underclass as essential workers. And they're the ones that have to go out and face an unvaccinated public and do the deliveries and do the garbage and doing the this and that. If they're essential workers, they ought to be paid as essential workers. Why should a basketball player get $20 million dollars and the guy who's serving your food or delivering your groceries or taking care of your house is barely able to live on 10 or $12 an hour. So that's one thing that's become very clear. And the pandemic has really clarified those fault lines that uh, people who are living 12 to an apartment cannot social distance. You know, people who uh, are live in neighborhoods where there are no vaccinations or who, who have difficulty getting this stuff or live in rural areas that are underserved. So we have a completely unequal medical system in the same way that we have a completely unequal uh, economic system. And now I'm seeing really disturbing signs. For instance, the CDC is announcing, well, you only have to sequester for five days, but they're not calling for a test after five days to see that you're negative. So you could still be harvesting bacteria and viruses and go back to your workplace and and reintroduce it to others. And this seems to me like a completely political adjustment that we got to get bodies out of the house. They're going nuts. We got to get the kids in school no matter what. No figures have been released that I can find about how many schools have re-adjudicated their ventilation systems about all their procedures. There's no mask mandates in a lot of schools. So once again, the political system is bowing to political outrage and malefactors and bad behavior and putting people literally at risk. And there's an answer to it. And the answer is you open up the public treasury. You open up the treasury and you do what they did during the height of the first pandemic. You give people money to keep their employees fed, to keep their, to be able to keep their businesses in place, to prevent landlords from throwing people out in the street. And you stop worrying about the public debt. We can print the money. They had a trillion dollars to give to Trump's, Trump's richest supporters. Nobody blinked at that. Uh, Joe Manchin is not asking for any money to retrain coal miners to get out of their extinct business, which is killing the rest of us. He could have asked for more money and begun training his coal miners how to do something else, computer work, online work, whatever it is. So Solar panels. I see the same collaboration of wealth and power protecting its own and putting everybody else at risk and inconvenience. That's what I see. And I see people are frightened and it's more acceptable to express rage than fear. So we see all these viral videos of people nutting in a Walmart because somebody asked them to wear a mask. Well, that's a fear reaction. That's not, we, we call it rage. It feels more manly to be outraged. It feels more potent, but it's actually fear. And, you know, I think at this point it's becoming Darwin, Darwinian. 
We're going to see Florida, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, these states just start to lose people, lose voters. And I don't know whether the Ron Dantises and that Texas governor who's as dumb as a pile of rocks think only Democrats are going to die, but they're going to lose voters. You know, they're going to lose uneducated people. So maybe they think only uneducated people vote for Democrats. I don't know. What What do you think what about? I mean, we you you can you make a lot of sense with all of your points here in terms of foreign policy, economics, foreign policy, economics. It seems like the issue like the right issue now. Right now. It happens to be like people will believe anything. The conspiracy theories that people are just buying the craziest things. And if I'd love to have a serious argument, you know, disagreement with people on policy and priorities and ethics and so on. But as long as, you know, a high percentage of people think that what they think about vaccines, what they think about uh, climate, what they think about the election. It's just, they're living in earth 2.0. Like how do we, what has worked? How concerned are you about losing more and more people down the rabbit holes of Alex Jones, et cetera? Well, I'm completely concerned. And, and there's a, there's a simple premise that I ask, which is why should you be allowed to lie on the public airwaves? I mean, let's just start there. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. You can't scream a lie that's going to create a panic. But Facebook and the social media apps have generated so much money. And in, an, in a political system, which is organized around money, in a Congress, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of money, that's what sets public policy. So... In this film, I saw this film called Social Contract, yeah. where a whole bunch of vice presidents from Facebook and TikTok and social media said, our algorithms are leading the country toward civil war. This is what we're afraid of. We won't let our kids watch it. So this is no different than tobacco manufacturers letting other people smoke and stopping their kids from smoking. So until we have some framework of rules like you have in a basketball game, like you have in a football game. Guy couldn't even overinflate, underinflate a football by two pounds without making a scandal a few years ago because everyone intuitively understood that without a common set of rules, a basic assumption of what goes on, you can't play football, baseball, or basketball. You can't let one guy use a bat that weighs 12 pounds. So until we are serious about, about privileging the public space and the value of information and that not all speech is protected, speech that's designed to overthrow our system should not be protected by our system. I'm sorry. I mean, it's like Holocaust deniers. It's against law in Germany to do that. They're not kidding around. They destroyed their country this way. So they are setting the same kind of reasonable controls on speech that we would like to set on guns. You make too much sense, but I always feel in terms of the, th that argument that it would be, even if there were laws in place, policies in place, they would find ways around getting that speech out now with the way, you know, technology is, and they would just be able to continue to platform it. Or that when we, as we have deplatformed the craziest people in different situations, for example, there was a doctor who was removed from Twitter because he was saying crazy things about the vaccine. But then the most popular podcaster in the country had him on his show and he's on Spotify, Joe Rogan. I mean, I guess he could get him off Spotify, but then he's going to go somewhere else. And it's, it just seems to be a, an impossible thing to prevent uh, the craziest people in the world from going on the most popular platforms and saying whatever they want about the moon being made of cheese, which you may have an opinion on. Why are they doing that? Somebody is getting rich doing it. So if you cut off the money, if you give them a Dixie cup and a thread and say, say whatever you want, I'm not really worried about it. But when you allow technology to amplify everything they say in ways which are visibly eroding the safeguards and safety nets of the country, visibly, visibly spreading it. I mean, look now, 
Ohio and Michigan have overruled their legislators, the courts, have overruled their Republican legislators who were gerrymandering because most of the people in those states don't want gerrymandering. They don't want candidates to be able to pick their voters. They want candidates to have to compromise between the extremes of the voters and come up with reasonable issues that will win the majority. So until we start creating rules that are going to generate a society that runs well, which means no gerrymandering, which means safeguards on the elections, which means federal standards for elections, which means federal standards for voting, we're not going to be the United States. And if you go all the way back and read the Federalist Papers, you'll see the entire Federalist Papers were an argument about why a collection of single states would fail. Very brilliant, very prescient arguments. So even now, Putin and Biden are talking to one another, and Putin wants a guarantee that NATO is not going to keep recruiting. So why is he saying that? He's saying that because the Cuban Missile Crisis was solved by the United States government making a deal with the Russians. You'll take your missiles out of Cuba. We'll take our missiles out of Turkey which are on your border, and we will not include any new Eastern European com countries in NATO. So we leave the Russians of their hegemony in their area, and we made that deal. And that deal was in force until Clinton broke it. And Clinton began recruiting Eastern European countries. Now, I think Putin is a murderer. I think he's a thug. I think he's an autocrat. But when you've allowed NATO to come up, press against all his borders, and then Ukraine decides they want to vote to go west, you know he has to do something. So we can blame him, but we've pushed him into that corner. And if you push a rat into a corner, he's going to hide his way out. So uh, without, and they say the same thing about Iran. Without making deals and regulations and saying, this is the way everybody gets what they need, you can't have a, a peaceful globe or a peaceful country. I, I wanted to ask you, given your perspective uh, on your long life, uh, I think Wikipedia says you're 80. Is that right now? Yeah, I turned 80 in October. God damn, you look so goddamn good, Peter Coyote. I wish I you were. Should I should see wish it I from were. the inside. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I were there to run my hand through your hair, but I'm not. Then, so I have to ask you about something about your life, I'll, which is, I'll do it. Oh, look at that's my porn right there. So, so I mean, I just got to ask you about voting rights. The the argument that I've kind of tried to make with people is, you know, we got a lot of folks quoting Martin Luther King, content of the character, not the color of your skin. That's the America that we want to live in. A lot of folks who I would consider are, are, are pretty racist, ignorant bigots using that quote. It's my understanding, uh, according to history, that primary initiative, although there were so many others, that King and the civil rights movement, John Lewis and others fought for was voting rights. And guess what? They won. They got voting rights. Recently, the Supreme Court gutted Dr. King's signature achievement. And right now, that's what we're trying to restore in America. You witnessed that with your long, amazing life. You are part of that move. So I just have to ask your perspective, given it seems like we're fighting the same fight that you fought and others fought in the 60s, again, in 2022. Well, on some level, everything goes back to the American people. When the American people elect a completely divided legislature with no margins, everything is a compromise. You're dealing with, you know, John Kennedy was dealing with Southern segregationists. Johnson was dealing with Southern segregationists. They had a huge amount of power. They controlled the Democratic Party in some sense. But the people put up enough fuss and the, the first civil rights marches where you saw, saw everyday black people dressed like they were going to church, never raising their voices unless it was in song, 
being set upon by peckerwood rednecks and mobs and dogs and fire hoses, it drew a line in the sand. And you had to make a decision which side of that line you were going to be on. And that line was either going to be trying to fulfill the promise of America as it was written by slaveholders, but who knew better, who saw the future, who wanted something else, or whether you were going to let racists and people whose economic well-being was founded in suppression win the day. And so to me, the issue from Jump Street should have been voting rights, but Biden had no margins. And if I was, bar if I was Biden, I would probably be thinking, if I can get the infrastructure bill through, and if I can get the build back better through, I'll get money in people's pockets. I'll show them that government does things for them. I'll relax the, the competition for scarce goods and resources, and then I'll be able to do voters' rights. But unfortunately, it's such a, it's such a, a capstone piece of legislation that without it, we lose control of the process. So I'm with you. It's the number one thing. And Americans have to say, are you really threatened by black people doing better? Are you really threatened by Mexicans and Asians doing better? It may mean you're going to have to try harder. It may mean that your kid just can't roller dirt all through high school and college and come take his seat as a CEO but really, it's going to be better for everybody. You're not going to have to look over your shoulder at the auto teller when you're taking money out at night. And so until the American people give somebody margins, give the Democrats margins with which to do that, we're stuck with this ridiculous two-party system, which is, you know, it's not nearly as responsive as a parliament would be. But it's what we've got, and it's why you're getting 50 fundraising letters every single day, no matter how much money you give to the Democrats, as if your 100 or $250 that count are the hedge funds and the derivative traders and the fi finance, insurance, and real estate industry that actually own 60% of this government. So, I mean, it's we people have to agree to make a change and Congress will never vote to end money. And the only way that I've been able to even conceive of this happening would be a kind of general strike where people just say, you know what, we're just going to stop shopping. Yeah. We're going to buy as little as we possibly can, a gallon of gas, trade clothes with our friends, stop buying shit until we get control of our Congress back and get some clean money, federal regulations against being controlled by capital. I don't know how can, to do it. Can we continue to buy sustainable products like uh, Patagonia? I really like, uh, I just bought a vest and I, I think I'll keep it for 25 years. So yeah, you will. I'm in the Patagonia family. You know, I've been, I get a discount from them. I've worked with them for years. Of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah, of course there are going to be a lot of people punished. People, people are not going to be allowed to not pay their rent. But somehow there has to be a slowdown so that the coins stop dropping into the tin cups that are owned by the 1% and one-tenth of 1%. I can't see another way to it unless the whole thing falls apart. What do you say to the collective darkness that has creeped upon society, this feeling of existentialism that used to be more particular to people who knew about philosophy now really feeling and, and, and living, being forced to kind of live in a way to stay in the moment for fear of what tomorrow brings. H how do we, how do we cope in a time with a pandemic and with dwindling democracy and the climate emergency and all of the rest of the things, some of which we, we talked about, how do we get up, uh, go about our day, find joy, you know, do all the things we might have done before that we perhaps took for granted, maybe. Well, you're talking to a Buddhist priest. That's why I asked so, you. So for me, the first step is not believing everything you think, interrogating your own mind, interrogating the train of thought that runs through that inner speak 
that we all take for granted is us. And the best mechanism I know to do that is meditating. Meditating actually softens our personality, makes it more like a colander. Because our personality is just this tiny little thing in the immensity of the universe. But it's the immensity of the universe that produced us. Without oxygen, there's no us. Without sunlight, there's no us. Without water, there's no us. Without pollinating insects, there's no us. Without microbes in the soil, there's no us. So you can take it all the way out to the Earth's place in space. If we were closer to the sun, water would burn off, no us. If we were farther away, water would freeze, no us. And the Earth is being held that way by all the gravitational forces of the universe. So we're actually doing very little. We're not making our hearts beat. We're not making ourselves breathe. We're not making the millions of process that keep our bodies together. So we call that big mind. We call that oscillating formless energy that keeps changing into things big, big mind. So meditating allows you to put like holes in your personality to let big mind leak in. And in big mind, everything's there. There are no contradictions. All the questions, all the answers, all the oppositions are all contained by what Buddhists call emptiness, which is the great common denominator. Imagine, imagine an ocean that was made up of millions of little choppy waves, not big rollers, little individual choppy waves. Each one of those choppy waves could be a named thing in the universe. Could be a person, could be a leopard, could be a, a mountain range, could be a solar system, anything you could name. But the principle is the same. It comes out of the formlessness of the ocean and it assumes form for a while. Maybe the tw 24 hours of a mayfly, maybe the centuries of a mountain range. It assumes form, and then it goes back into the ocean. And when it's in form, if it's a person, we call it living. And when it goes back to the ocean, we call it dead. But what we forget, and what those little waves forget, is that they've never for one instant not been part of the ocean. And when you meditate, you remember that you're part of the ocean. You remember that you're made of the ocean. You're not different from not Donald Trump. You're not different from the neighbor you hate. You may behave differently, but you're not essentially different. You have no higher right to be here than they do. So when you do that over and over and over, you learn to detach from your thoughts because you're putting part of your awareness in your posture and then the little hand gesture called a mudra looks like this. You lay one hand over the other, and you keep, this is your attention gauge. If this collapses, you're not paying attention. If your thumbs come apart, you're not paying attention. So you're in a posture, and you're following your exhales, and you're watching that mudra, and that part of your awareness can't be captured by your train of thought. So it's like making a little ledge that you can watch your thinking on, and you can just let the mind spin out and be spinning out, being the mind, because you're not caught by it. It's like sitting in a car with a clutch. You can put the clutch in, you can race the engine as much as you want. It's not going anywhere. When you need to go, you let the clutch out. So most of the time, we don't have to think too much in life. Everything's being done for us. We're being breathed, our heart's being beaten. You know, we know where we left the tomato. Uh, when we have to think, you can let the clutch out and you can engage with your mind and dedicate it to something. But the problem with most people is when something comes that gets them frightened or upset or anxious or that they really want, they glom onto it and it runs them around and it makes them do a lot of undignified, crazy things. And what Buddha taught was that by meditating, you can contain those impulses. You can face the peppery wind of reality with dignity. There's nothing dignified about being a drunk. There's nothing dignified about being a junkie. There's nothing dignified about having illicit affairs, being a compulsive shopper, a compulsive gambler. What meditation teaches you is that we're all being constantly afflicted by the world. That's the first noble truth, affliction. When we're afflicted, things arise in the mind. Neither of those are our fault. 
Buddha calls them noble truths. Why? Truth means, first of all, real. And noble means worthy of respect, worthy of dignity. So affliction and arising, you have no control over. They just come. The third noble truth is called containment. Uh, in, in The first one is dukkha. The second one is samudaya. The third one is called naroda. And it's uh, something any peasant can understand. It's like a clay wall around a fire pit. And it stops the sparks from leaping out of the fire pit and burning down the fields and the village. If you throw gasoline on the ground, it does nothing. If you put it in the container of an engine, it does work. So what Buddha teaches us is that because everything is dependent on everything else, you can sit with whatever arises and you can watch it, you can feel it, you can watch it come and you can watch it go. And when you can contain the energy of affliction and arising, that's what moves you around. That's what moves you away from the fire. That's right. what makes you want to give somebody the finger. When you can contain it, then you can follow the eightfold path, which is how to live a life of service and help to others, of dignity, making the world better. And he's trying to enlist you in a big game to save all people. So if you want to have a good time again, if you want to relax, you have to not be attached to your mind. You have to have resting places. You can't just believe everything you think. And you have to practice sitting still and learning to trust your posture, learning to trust your body, and learning to build discipline and attention to deal with whatever comes up. Because we've all got a junkyard dog inside us that's tearing the territory up. And we need to housebreak it. And you can only housebreak it by being still. End of lecture. Ah, oh, too bad. I want more. Wow, that was uh, wonderful. And I just I just love to talk to you for all of the reasons that we've been talking to you and all of your answers. And what a pleasure and an honor. I guess before I let you go, I, I do want to ask you uh, one more, which is about your book. If you want to talk about uh, the Lone Ranger and Tonto meet Buddha. I, I, I haven't gotten it yet, but when I do, I'll, I'd like to do a you know more thorough conversation about it. But talk sure. to me about this. The subtitle masks meditation and improvised improvised play to induce liberated states what are we talking about well just remind me that i have to get your mailing address but i'll tell you what it is i'll, I'll email you so the first time i ever put on a mask in the san francisco mime troupe um and looked in a mirror it was an utterly uh utter revelation all of a sudden P.D. Coyote disappeared. And the guy that was trying to be a nice guy, a kind guy, a well-behaved guy, all this stuff was gone. And with that departure also went all my self-consciousness, all my self-criticism, all my second-guessing, all my self-doubt. I never forgot that. When I began to study Buddhism seriously, and I was working as an actor, I began to see that there were some, there were some, uh, congruences between certain meditative states and certain acting states where you were really free to get outside your own personality. And about 40 years ago, I developed these classes and these criteria where after about four, four and a half hours of messing with you in a safe environment, making you do things without thinking, changing your posture, changing the way you behave, changing your status so that you run into the edges of the self. You go, oh, that's not me. Well, you just saw an edge of the self. So if I do that for four or five hours and, and uh, push you in a way that's not going to freeze up, when I put a mask on you and I hold a mirror up in front of it, you, Pete Dominic will go. And you will see in the mask some holographic personality that you will understand to the depth of him with everything you know about yourself as a category in this new self. Your posture will be different. Your walk will be different. You can answer me about your siblings, about everything. And so I'll do three people at a time and I'll have them interact with the class and with each other. And they do it for about 10 minutes. And then we switch masks and they find a new character and they do it again. 
By the time they've done it three times, it's cold sober, they are open to hear me talk about Buddha's understanding that was no fixed self, that the thing we call our self is just an awareness. There's no little organ like a walnut with your name on it tucked under your liver or no little homunculus behind your forehead doing your seeing, hearing, and living. Your eyes have awareness, your ears have awareness, your body has awareness, and the mind kind of has its own awareness that includes them all. But there's no nothing that corresponds to an organ, which is a self. So once you understand that you're just sort of an empty pipe filled with awareness, nobody can insult you, nobody can get on your bummer side. I mean, whatever you put your awareness to will fill that space. And so what I tell people is that if you want to recreate this on your own, you need to learn how to meditate and you need to learn Buddha's description of reality. Now, because there's a lot of heavy lifting in that, I thought, well, that'll get dry. So I wrote this parable about the Lone Ranger and Tonto, whose scriptwriter died, and they were lost in the desert, and they were fat and overweight, and the horses were lame. They didn't know how to get anywhere. They had nobody writing their scripts. And they see the Buddha camping under a cottonwood tree. And they go over there, and he jumps up. He takes such great care of their horses. He wraps comfrey leaves around their lame feet. He takes the saddlebags off. He airs out the blankets. He airs out the saddles that the Lone Ranger says to Tonto Sato Voce, this guy must be the well-trained servant of a very, very rich man. Let's stick around. Maybe we can get a loan from this guy. Maybe he'd even invest in a movie. Who knows what's going to happen? Of course, the Buddha sees through this bingo and he keeps them and he plays a beneficent trick on them. And he gets them to help build a treasure house for his master out of stone. And these guys are hauling boulders and hawking down trees and they're getting in good shape and they're building a camp. And each one has a kind of enlightenment experience. And it's a kind of good humored way. The Lone Ranger stands for the epitome of 1950s white entitlement. And Tonto is just a human being, you know, comes from a different culture. But both of them have human dilemmas, and both of them have an enlightened experience. And for me, it was like a good-hearted, light-hearted way of explaining what happens, what all these exercises and practices are actually about. So that book is out now, and send me your address. I'll send you one. It's on Amazon, and so too is my first book of poems called The Tongue of a Crow. And as I told you, I've been pimping myself on every podcast and interview and it's like i hope i'm selling books but i have no idea how important is it to you for you to sell books well it's important to sell enough that the publisher will do the next one right 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 i mean you know my first book sleeping where i fall has sold about fifty-five thousand books but it came out in 1999 but it's still in print and my second one's called the rain man's third cure that's still in print. So they sell enough to stay in print, which I like. The Rain Man uh, is the one I, I've read, and I absolutely love that book. Love, love, love. I learned oh, you so never, much. You, you never read the first one? Nope. Okay, it's coming to you. <laughs> no, I, I, I just, I'll go buy them all. No, friends don't, I, 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 I buy the books, but I hope everybody listening will also uh, purchase these books as a way to thank you for joining us. And, um, and purchase as, them from an ind from an independent bookstore if you can. If you can't buy them from Amazon, but it's always better to help out a small bookstore. Absolutely, they'll order especially, them for you, especially now. Okay, sir. Well, um, I hope you'll join us for uh, our, our group at at some point whenever you want. We do Thursday nights. I will. And um, I just at uh, what time? What's that? At what time? We do Thursday nights at eight p.m. almost every week. 8 p.m. Eastern. Is there another time zone? <laughs> yeah. 8 p.m. Eastern, I'm in bed. But sometime I'll do it. I'm on this, the Pacific time zone. You're in it's bed. three hours earlier. You're, you're not in bed at 5 p.m. Eastern. Oh, that's right. Sorry. I was I mean, thinking 11. I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe you are. 
No, this is why NASA turned me down to run the space shuttle. <laughs> Thursday nights at 5 p.m. All right, send me a link. I'll show up sometimes. Oh, we, you, you're, you tease us. You kid us. We're very excited. Very, very excited no, by the process. I will do. I will okay, do. sir. Um, please be in touch. Call me anytime just to shoot the shit. I'm very excited about your new work. And uh, I, I, I'm so grateful to be in your presence today, if, even virtually. Thank you so much. Take right, care, I'll, Pete. I'll, I'll, all right. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. How do I hang up? Hey.